Yeah, hi, welcome back. We are now going to visit with Lynn Heiner, who is another fantastic artist here at the Festival of Arts. And her style is completely different to most photography work that we see here. Her work is implied realism. So as photographers, we look at something and we want to see all the details, the nuts and bolts and all the details, where her artwork shows a implicated subject or theme and the viewer can then look at it and make its mind up what it is. So one of the things that is totally intriguing to me is this looks like just splashy artwork with blues and reds and orange. But to people that know that this is a turbo Porsche from the 80s, and it's hard to see that that's a turbo Porsche. One of the things that I've actually talked to Lynn about is these dribbly things at the bottom. And we will get to ask Lynn about the dribbles. Again, with this here, implied, it's a 66 Corvette General Motors and a Lotus at the top there. Now, most people wouldn't know what they are unless they know the actual vehicles. And again, why these dribbles at the bottom? And we will get to the bottom of that and find out why Lynn likes to have dribbles at the bottom of her photos. Sorry, of her artwork, not photos. OK, welcome back, everybody. And I'd like you to now meet Lynn Heiner, another fantastic artist here at the Festival of Arts. And the reason that I wanted to talk to Lynn today is because of her implied realism of her artwork. The fact that she uses a spatula and throws paint together in a messy kind of a way to me, not to the artist. And then you as the viewer can actually look at the artwork and see and identify what it is. So thank you for joining us today, Lynn. Thanks, Peter. Okay. How did you get into doing this style of artwork? Actually, it was kind of a process. I, um, I had been technically trained in realism and uh, I was finding myself frustrated when I actually came back to art about 10 years ago. Once I started to look at different avenues, I found that the looser I would get, the more I would try and drive into the essence of a project or into a piece, that was where I would discover the ability to just loosen up. I actually I took an abstract class of all things just to see if there was something there that I could learn from, and right. that was actually helpful. Do you use brushes at all? None. No brushes? No. So you just use acrylics? Everything is acrylic. Everything is with a palette knife. So Palette knife and different types of palette knives? I do big... use my digits, yeah. Your digits. Digits. Okay, your fingers. So <laughs> your artwork is finger painting? Some of it. Okay. Not much. The majority is definitely with knives. And yes, I do use different size knives, but the majority is one size. And actually, you guys are editing, right? <laughs> You're going to edit, right? Because I wanted to grab a knife and I forgot because I was so late. No? No. Yeah? Go get it. All right. It'll be a miracle. It'll be right there. It will be right there, because this time I actually set it down right there. Thinking, oh, I'll come in early. I'll get my knives. <laughs> so fix the wire. Oh. Fix the wire. Yeah. Yep, there we go. So what kind of implements do you use to do your artwork? Are these the things you're talking about? Yeah, these are retired knives. They've either been destroyed. The edge is no longer sharp. But that's actually my favorite shape. That's probably in just about every single painting I use this size unless they're very, very small, but those are retired. And the flexibility, they're very nimble, but very sharp. I cut my fingers most days. Okay, so you have to be, so it's the thickness, mm -hmm. the pace that you wipe it, it is the direction that you wipe it. So- Yeah, this is the uh, most versatile for me, personally. Is it safe to assume that no two pieces of your artwork are the same? No, they would definitely not be the same. Actually, I've had uh, clients who they see a piece, they want it bigger, and my first thing is, you understand it's not going to look the same. <laughs> just so we're clear, it will never look the same. Okay. But okay. it'll be close. So it just won't be the same. When did you start to feel that doing this kind of style of impressionistic artwork is your cup of tea? 
Well, it was after that uh, abstract class I took, I found that there was something beautiful in the layering process. And once I understood the layering and the essence, again, those are the two things that are incorporated in every piece is layering and essence. And if I start to get too detailed, I will actually mess up the painting before I even continue. Because I, once you get adept at any tool, I think it's true for photographers and it's true for any artist, if you become so prolific or so, uh, so used to the tools you use, you can find yourself doing it arbitrarily and without thought. And so for me personally, I will sometimes just get out of my headspace. I'll, I'll do something completely obnoxious or different and get out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about being in like the automatic mode where yes. it all comes back to you so easy and you follow through. Yeah. So it becomes more of a production piece versus a creative piece. Right. So how do you start? OK, what preference do you have for canvases? And do you start with a white canvas? And the other question is that in your studio, do you have a lot of unfinished work that you paint over? Not paint over, but I have a lot of pieces that are in pro what I call process. So no painting stays white for very long. No canvas stays white. And yes, I do use a primed canvas mostly. That's I'll, I'll either personally stretch it or I'll buy it from a, a, a guy who makes them for me. So right. he just he's good at what he does. He saves me time. I, I prefer that method. So what is the process with regards to time? So do you look at a photo and say, oh, that looks nice, or I look at these flowers, I look at this car? I mean, because, you know, you've got a, um, a diversity of, of flowers and cars. I do. Okay, so it's like it's both my, ends of the spectrum. It's both sides of my personality. Both sides of your personality. <laughs> it's true. I like to go fast, which is part of my problem getting here. <laughs> Traffic. Uh, and the flowers, I like pretty things. I love beautiful things. And so both sides are kind of what I enjoy, what I appreciate. And, um, and so you're asking the question, how do I get to the subject of it? Sometimes I start a painting without knowing it, especially in the early days. Right now, there's a lot of projects that I'm working on. So there's not that level of, hmm, what feels good to create right now? Right now, I'm in sort of let's get it done right. sort of mode. Uh, but when I am in that creative space, I will usually just start with the abstract on the, the very first layer, and then I'll build a background. And often, because I take so many photos as I, before anything, just when I'm out and about, that's where I'll start to look through all my references. And if it's a car or if it's a floral, I'll kind of decide from there what feels or fits with what I want to produce here, right. what I now, want to create. The artwork that we see here now, are these hybrids of photos or they're exact sort of a reproduction of what you've seen in your mind? So they're both, <laughs> actually, they are both. Uh, the cars are always from reference. Uh, so that was from uh, an auction. I took the photo while it was spinning actually on the TV of all things. Um, but I was, I was photographing with my phone what I saw and then I would edit later what I wanted to capture in, in the space I want to capture. Uh, the top one, the Lamborghini, I actually, there was a mirror at our local Cars and Coffee. I shot it in various spots. I edit out everything I need to edit out and then I, I hone in on what I want. And that's the same with that piece right there, that 911. Um, but the florals will often be hybrids or like I'll have seen a, a, a picture that I love and I might kind of use it, but maybe I don't like per particular flowers or coloring, so mm -hmm. I will adjust. Other ones are fully imaginative. Most of the little ones are imaginative. And then I've got a giant one that I'm working on in, in studio right now that's imaginative. So how do you know when to stop? Well, first of all, I let them sit for a while. Everything's got to sit for a while. Because if I just go, brilliant, <laughs> let's go, let's be done, uh, then I know that I'm actually just trying to get the job done. I don't find that I'm actually sitting with the piece and saying, is it really done? Is it really done? Yeah. But when I can stop and look at it and go, ooh, 
That's mm -hmm. cool. That's awesome. I and, like that. And that applies to our photography world as well. I, I mean, we would be editing photographs and look at it, and one of our rules that we sort of have, rule of thumb, is to walk away for a few hours or leave it there for a day or two, and all of it, uh, of us have experienced this where you come back and you go, what was I thinking? What was I looking at? Why did I end up with that? I mean, oh my God, it looks completely different. So that's interesting. So do you do commission work for clients? If they come and show you they've got a family portrait or oh, yeah. they have something, how do you handle that in a way that they know they're going to get something that's not going to look exactly like their photo? Well, first of all, I don't do people. <laughs> There's no people, no people. No people. Knives and people, not a very nice combination. And so I just, I, I make it a hard rule. Sorry, knives with people? Knives and people. Oh, Do knives. Not so your knives and people okay. with knives. Right. Done it. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, and pets, no pets. No, no pets, no people. <laughs> so you're selective. Rules. You're selective. I am selective, only in that people have, whether or not they want to admit it, they have a perceived notion of how they look in their mind. And so if I have not facilitated that, it's not going to work for mm -hmm. either of us. Mm -hmm. They'll be unhappy as a client. Mm -hmm. So I just I say a hard no. Right. And you're showing artwork across the United States. Yep. You're in, in various galleries, extremely successful. But there's been some sort of feedback that's been coming back that um, it's very reminiscent of Jackson Pollock work. <laughs> and I'm saying that because I'm leading to <laughs> the dribbly lines at the bottom. Now, I know it's your style and I know it's your signature, but why wouldn't you paint the painting on the ground so you don't get dribble marks? <laughs> Well, I do just to irritate you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. No, the the dribbles actually the, you know, they came actually out of an editing process, and it was in that point when I was cultivating, trying to develop my style. It was I was trying to get rid of something I was creating on the canvas, and as I was editing it off, which is something you can do with acrylic, you cannot do with oils. Um, Sorry, when you say editing off, you're talking about wiping it off? Yeah, I was spraying it down to get rid of, like, get it wet so I could then wipe it but off. You, but you can do that with oils. You just do the layering. You just lay up. Well, yeah, and I could have layer. actually cut it off if I really wanted to with a knife. Right. But what I, because I was working with acrylics, I started to spray it and try and get rid of it. And then all of a sudden there was something, uh, I don't know, provocative about it. And in the, this is part of the process. Why wouldn't I leave it? Yeah. And then it became the, Ooh, can I be okay with that? In my perfectionist way of being, it became part of the thing I had to lean into. Is the same with the being uh, hyper realistic versus in, in expressionism, impressionism, loose essence. Those yeah. are those things that I. And I look. I love the dribbles, and it says it says <laughs> to me. Excellent. I do love the dribbles. <laughs> it says to me that the artwork is as it is, and. I don't care about the tri dribbles because they contribute to the artwork, <laughs> which they do. They contribute they do. to the artwork. And it's not a... Uh, Some people really don't like them and they can't get past them. I know, I know. And I just brought that up because it is, you know, nobody said to Jackson Pollock, you can't have dribbles in your artwork. And he's one of the most famous impressionistic painters in the United States. Impressionistic. Impressionistic? No. What was he? Abstract. Abstract. Just okay. helping you out there, just so I know. you know. <laughs> Help me out, because art to me is Try a very not new to subject. You on camera, but no, I, that's I, fine. That's <laughs> fine. You're allowed to. So, what would you say to photographers who are watching this? How to improve their photography? I think we all, uh, well, probably the best advice I was given when I was really starting was keep doing it and man have fun that actually i feel like we lose the 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 ability to have fun when we constantly are working to have a masterpiece when we are working to have a masterpiece we lose the actual sight of what we're doing so that would probably be my first piece of advice i'd also say play with your medium you've got cameras you've got filters you've got subjects, all the ver variety of things, really play right, with it. Right. So. so what's next for Lynn? What's next? Well, 
in a couple of weeks. I, I will, my booth will still be here, obviously, but I will be heading up to Monterey Car Week for uh, Pebble Beach mm. Concours de Elegance, which is all cars, obviously, and I'll take a 20-foot uh, display and I'll show a bunch of different work. How's um, the response that you get at uh, Pebble Beach? It's very good. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's different. My work is different than a lot of the other, con my contemporaries, I, and I understand we were all taught a certain way. It's hard to push out of what's, what is what we know. No, no. Exactly. And even right now, this is what I know, and sometimes I want to push away from it just so I can get a different vibe. But this is right now, the f this is still fun for me until it stops being fun. I will stay in this zone. So you're very comfortable where you're at now. It's fun. You're enjoying it. Yeah. What do you see yourself doing in the next 10 years? Uh, let's see, vacationing in Tuscany for months at a time. <laughs> of, course. of course. What is that? Is that too pretentious? No, I would no like, it's not. I would like to be able to like literally set up shop there and like take all the noise away just so I can kind of, because this has been amazing. I'm grateful for it, but it is also I'm constantly on the go, so I can't hear myself think sometimes. Mm -hmm. And when you stop hearing what your true heart of hearts is saying, it really becomes a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting things about your artwork is the intention of negative space and also the content. Now, as photographers, sometimes we get a little bit lazy and we have telephone poles and some other things in there that needed to be taken out. But we do get some feedback with some other photographers saying that they leave it in there personally. But what is your feeling with regards to the negative space and the intention that you have on why things are where they are in your paintings? Well, personally, I want you to have to think it through. I'm not, I'm, I'm not spelling it out for you. I don't think as a photographer you need to spell it out for people. There needs to be some, some of the search some of the, I, but I, it was interesting, I, this painting in particular, there was a woman who came in and she's like, I think you would have had a, a, a you'd have better audience reaction if it were centered. And, and I kind of laughed because just the day before, a woman was in here actually crying because it had just had such a powerful response for her personally. She had felt it deeply. And then when she saw the title of the piece, Manifestation of Joy, then she was like, it, it, my sister had passed. I mean, like there was literally a whole story that she had already filled in in her mind. Right. I didn't need to say anything at that point. Right. And it fit. Whereas this other woman needed it to be perfection, no dribbles, and it needed to be centered. And I, I, I found that fascinating because it bothered her. And then in, actually, I, I go back to abstract, art is supposed to elicit a reaction and it did used to <laughs> elicit a very negative reaction in me personally until I understood. And, that, and that's what you want. I don't want my artwork, and I think as photographers you would feel the same way, I don't want anyone to just go, oh, that's pretty, I just want it because it, I need to fill a blank spot in my wall. I right. want it to have meaning, I want it to have purpose, I want it to have a joyful reaction in your soul. And that's but, what we do. But we all know that you can't make everybody happy because not Perfect. everything appeals to everybody. Perfect. I don't want to have mass appeal. Right. right. I don't want, I mean, well, don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to sell work. I'm not trying to not sell work. But, but, the, but. The, the question of everything in your artwork is intentionally put where you want it to be. Yes, including off the canvas. The negative so, space, everything. The negative space. Yes. So let's go to this piece behind me. I actually, so there was a photo reference, and so I was kind of, I was, I was following the line of it, but I didn't quite appreciate or it didn't feel right that there was actually, it, it was more of a C, like the, yep. the bouquet kind of had more of a C reaction, which is typical. So I had to sort of, in my mind, I started off actually quite a bit further away and I only slightly moved into that negative space so that it would have that pressure without filling in the gap. So that's a little mm -hmm. bit of what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I know you had a lot of help, especially with your family members. Yeah, Rob and, is my right hand. Oh, he's a wonderful man, yeah. her husband outstanding. He's yeah. here every day doing all the hard work 
and cleaning up and just he's just <laughs> a mag had, just two fabulous people tell me you really married up <laughs> in the last 24 married hours. Married up. Man, I'm like, okay, I didn't know it's chopped liver. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true. I did marry up. Rob Heiner. Okay. Lovely. <laughs> and for people that want to get in touch with Lynn, how would they get in touch with you? That's pretty easy. You can go to my website. It's lynnheiner.com, L-Y-N-H-I-N-E-R, or on Instagram. If you love the florals, it's Lynn, Lynn Heiner Art, or if it's the cars, Lynn Heiner Cars. It's... <laughs> okay, something that you had asked me the first time that I thought was really good was about, like, how do we overlap, which is things like composition and things that, why would art be a part of the conversation versus... I just thought that was something. So I'm here again with Lynn Heiner, and we're, we're chatting about strategy, things that we, 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 we didn't chat about last time. And one of the things that I'd like to ask Lynn is, how does she think photography and artwork overlap together? Well, that's an excellent question, Peter. <laughs> I love it when my interviewees <laughs> drink on the way out. You know, it's just a good way to start the day. Yes. <laughs> it's nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Woo. Uh, so what do I think? OK, one of the things that I do believe is uh, helpful or one of the ways we look at things the same is composition. As photographers, you're looking at how your artwork fits within the parameters of your frame. And I am looking at it on my canvas, the same thing which is why I often start with a photograph and sometimes I'll finish with a photograph. I will use my camera as a means to see where everything lands on my canvas. Mm. I use that same frame like you guys use a camera so I know where I'm going. And because I don't do a lot of drawing on my canvas as I'm getting ready to produce the piece, I have to kind of feel it through. I will, so. I'm not going exact, but I do want to see where it's going to fit. And when I think I'm done, I will also take a photograph because there's something to be said about looking through that two by three inch screen to kind of see if you've captured it, like mm. all the way barreled down to the very essence and small. Because when I'm looking at it big, I can't see some things that I can see when I'm mm -hmm. looking at it small. Mm -hmm. What I think is, is wonderful about the artwork is the fact that you don't show the whole vehicle. It's just a piece of it. Yes. And that's what's interesting, and that applies to us for photographers as well. We don't have to show the whole car. We could show right. just the rear quarter, the, 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 the hood, or the wheels, or the lights. So I think that, yeah, that's an important factor. Mm -hmm. You don't have to show everything. You can show the main implied pieces. Well, I have car people who will look at this piece right here, this Porsche, and they'll be like, what is that? They know it's a car. They can't quite see what it is. Unless they, like me, grew up around Porsche their whole life. But that's what I want. I want you to have to kind of keep looking at it. I don't want you to have, Yeah. Don't fill in all the blanks. I know, but the, if it was a gray and white picture, you'd be struggling a little bit, but sure. you'd still know. But the fact that it's got the iconic blue color, which was for their limited edition turbos, and it is on posters, I mean, in kids' rooms when they were little kids and all the rest of it. Sure. It's like the Lamborghini Contash and, yep. and those exotic cars, so that you, in the 66, you know, Corvette, the fact that you don't show everything and it's no detail, there's those little blobs of paint. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a... It's un so complimentary. Yeah, that's a... <laughs> Uneducated way of talking about how to apply mm -hmm. spatula thin. Perfect. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, yeah, it's, that's what it is. Right. It is. It's 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 very thick application of paint, and it's because I don't like seeing canvas. And and <laughs> knowing that <laughs> Lynn exactly actually uses very thick paint, it's hard to imagine how those dribble marks can actually get there. Just saying the mystery. Yep. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wait, is there anything else uh, I think you forgot oh, to ask I, me? Really? There's more? Thank you, Lynn, for <laughs> sharing that today because there's a lot of really good tips there for photographers as well as other artists that are going to be watching this program. That's not almost a hundred. It's, it's good. 
It's amazing what they can do with it's facelifts these days, right? No facelift. No. <laughs> Just very good cream on my face. So we're doing another interview with a very temperamental artist, one that has got anger management issues and I also... Won't lie, it's true. And <laughs> as you can see from the set here today, we've taken all the sharp objects away because Lynn could get very hostile. <laughs> with you. And, um, well, it's probably time to get a drink right now. Excellent. Let's go.